Acts chapter 2, and I want to read uh, select verses, and uh, before the purpose of our message, I just will read those first uh, four verses, and we're going to look at several verses uh, from the second chapter of the book of Acts. Acts, cha Acts chapter 2, look at verse 1. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I want to read one more verse. Well, two more verses, verse 12, 13, and 14. So they're all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, lest this be known to you and heed my word. But these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. May the Lord just bless me to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, and may your word bring light and illumination to us today. May it lift our spirits, may it revive our souls, may it stir our faith, may it cause us to want to tell someone else about the wonderful love of God the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, may we be diligent and persistent and determined to tell as many people as we can what they must do to be saved. Speak to that person who needs to recommit their life to the Lord today and that one whose heart needs to be open to receive Christ for the first time. For your own glory, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you this morning from a simple subject of seven things the early church shared. Seven things the early church shared. In this day and age of change and flux and innovation and new ideas that basically are exploding in every area of our lives from business to education to schools and even to the church, it's also important that we as a church are look back at some principles that are timeless, things that bound or bind us together over time. Uh, methods might change, uh, but the message does not change, and there are some principles, I believe, that really kind of binds the church together uh, to make it a unique entity, the body of Christ, the continuation of the life of Jesus Christ in a community, and in a neighborhood, that group that bears witness to the reality that God is still alive and that God is still moving and God is still calling people from darkness into light and God is still blessing and God has not abandoned those tough, hard places where people have to live. And that's where I believe that the church, by definition, is this, this ecclesia, these called out ones, is to be a, a community of believers that bear witness in a place so people can see how this new community relates to each other, how they love each other, how faithful and devoted they are to each other, and how they share a, a vision and a mission uh, that is common. And so this invisible church, this universal church that is comprised of everyone, everywhere, who's ever put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, is made manifest by the local New Testament church that becomes visible for people to see. And that's why church attendance is important and Bible study is important and prayer meetings are important because it is important that we give a visible manifestation to our witness. On that, can I get a witness? <laughs> we have to have a visible manifestation uh, to this witness. And so even something as simple and as mundane as a picnic is an opportunity for us to bear witness. It's an opportunity to us to bear witness with our frivolity, with the laughter, and with the joy, 
and with the energy and excitement that is in the atmosphere, and that's all that's in our atmosphere. There's not smoke in our atmosphere. There's not spirits in our atmosphere that we're able to come together and have a great time in the name of the Lord. And the only spirit that's inside of us other than our own is the Holy Spirit. And so it's an opportunity to show witness that people can be high on life. When that life is connected to the life of God. So it's always important. The church has to have a visible witness that manifests the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, and a manifestation of God's kingdom and God's rule that is being actually moved through a group of people. And so we come back to Acts chapter 2 because this is where the church has its genesis. Prior to Acts chapter 2, the church is still a great mystery. It is a mystery in the Old Testament that God would call a group out of the world, both Jews and Gentile, and God would call them into a, a body to be the continuation of his life, and in his absence, God would continue the life and ministry of Jesus Christ through a body of believers. That is a mystery in the Old Testament. The Jews see themselves as being God's choice and God's chosen people, and they see God bringing his kingdom through them, through the reestablishment of their national entity. What they don't see is there will be a period known as the church age where God's main movement would be through this new entity that he would create and that would start in Acts chapter 2. Are you following me? And so it's so easy for us to lose sight of the importance of the local New Testament church, particularly when we have all these other expressions of Christianity in the 21st century through the media church, whether it's television, whether it's radio, whether it's, whether it's a computer, whatever it is, where the messages certainly can be preached more eloquently, more powerfully, and more accurately than what someone like myself could have articulate. Surely the messages can be preached, but what cannot be created is the body of Christ, the continuation of God's life. And so people need to be able to identify with a group of people that are seeking to continue the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is what God is establishing in Acts chapter 2. Now we know the setting, most of us for this text, it's the day of Pentecost. And Penta 50, this is 50 days since the Jewish Passover, which where Jesus himself was crucified as the final Jewish Passover lamb to bring salvation and redemption, redemption, not merely to cover their sins, but to take away the sins of all those who put their faith in Christ. So we understand that's the context here. So the Lord has fulfilled his ministry. He has been betrayed. He has been crucified. He has been raised from the dead. And he has also ascended back to his father. Before his ascension, we find this commission in Acts 1, verse 8. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to his disciples, standing on the Mount of, Transfigur Mount of, of, of Transfiguration and Ascension, before he ascends back to the Father, they raise a question, when will he restore the kingdom to Israel? In Acts chapter 1, verse 6. And in response to that question, he says to them in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own authority. So Jesus says, when Israel will be restored as a national entity, when God will fulfill his promise to the seed of David to return with the Messiah to sit on the throne and to reign, when that happens, it's not for them to know. He says, but what it is for you to know is what it is that I am getting ready to do. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to, the, and to the end of the earth. And what is always amazing and astounding to me when I read these texts about the Great Commission is that Jesus gives the disciples a worldwide mission, a worldwide mandate that they're going to go into all the world and they're going to make disciples. And they're going to start first in their own hometown of Jerusalem. They're going to go to the province of Judea. They're going to go to the Samarians where the Gentiles are. And then they will ultimately go to the whole world. 
But he gives them this worldwide mission, and he hasn't given them an organizational chart. He didn't give them a church constitution, and he didn't even give them bylaws, nor did he give them a building. But what he does, he gives them some principles, and more importantly, he's going to give them the Holy Spirit, that if, as they follow those things, other things will fall into place as they need for those things to happen. But this is kind of incredible. He gives them this worldwide mission. They're going to be a witness. They're going to bear witness to him. They're going to testify about his reality, testify about his power, testify about his grace. He's telling this ragtag bunch of disciples that his plan for moving his kingdom forward basically rests with them. Are you following me? But it doesn't rest with them alone in their own intellect, in their own strength, their own power, or their own ability. He promises them that he's going to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that they shared was they shared a promise. They had shared Christ, the disciples, and those who were part of Jesus' early ministry. Now what they share is a promise. They share the promise that he's going to resend them, send them the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the power that they need to do the work that he has commissioned them to do. They share a promise. Now, in the church today, we share the person of the Holy Spirit because when we come to faith in Christ, we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. We receive the person of the Holy Spirit. They shared the promise initially. They will later share the person, and we already share the person of the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? But not only did they share this promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit brought to them a hope. They shared a hope. The promise stirred with them a hope that something was going to happen that had not yet happened to them that would enable them to be and to do what God had called them to be and to do. They shared a hope. And so as the church, we must share the person of the Holy Spirit. We share the promise of the Lord's return. And we must bring, share a hope that God will fulfill the promise that he's made to us, that he will indeed use us to be the witnesses that he needs for us to be in our time of ministry. So they shared a promise, they shared a hope, and they shared an expectation. They expected something to happen. If they didn't expect something to happen, they would not have went back to Jerusalem like he told them to do. They're standing there gazing up into the heavens, and he says to them, you go back to Jerusalem, and there you wait for the promise of the Father. So they had this expectation that God was going to fulfill his promise, and they would start to see their hope realized. If there's one thing that I sometimes wonder whether it is still present in the church, and that is, do we have an expectation? Do we have an expectation of the visitation of the power of God in the person of the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring about a consequence that we so desperately desire to see happen and we so desperately need to happen. Do we have an expectation? When we come to church on Sunday morning, do we expect for God to move in our midst and stir our souls? Do we expect for the worship to be rich and to be high? Do we expect to be lifted? Do we expect someone to say, what must I do to be saved? Do we expect someone who's drifted away from the Lord return and recommit their lives to Christ? Do we expect, I believe we encounter the power of God where there is expectation that God will meet with us. They shared a promise. They shared a hope. They shared an expectation. And so because they had this promise, this hope, and this expectation, they did what the Lord told them to do. They went back to Jerusalem, and they were there together, the Bible says in verse 1. They were with one accord, and in one place, they were together. And so something else they shared was that they shared each other. They shared each other. They had each other. They knew that they had each other. Now, we sometimes don't understand the significance of this because they really were in somewhat of a, a no man's land, if you will. By that, I mean they knew how divisive that Jesus had been. So Jesus had been divisive in terms of coming to Jerusalem 
exposing the corruption of the Jewish religious system, arousing the animosity and the hatred and bitterness of the religious leaders because it exposed their hypocrisy, that led to Jesus being crucified. And so there was great division that now existed in their little nation state under the control of the Roman government that hadn't existed before. So the question in their minds is that where are we going to go from here? I think it was obvious to them they couldn't go back into Judaism as they'd been before, that they would not be received by the religious leaders. I think that was already obvious to them. So where were they going to go? And at this point, they weren't a huge number. There were 120 that were kind of identifying you know, publicly, they were identifying themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. They were small in number. So this sense of having each other was extremely important. The fact that they were bound together by, by, by the fact that they had all been followers of Jesus, and that brought them together, and it gave them a tremendous sense of solidarity that they shared each other together. Are you following me? Now, I'm not going to be long. So they shared a promise, they shared a hope, they shared an expectation which caused them to share the fellowship of each other. The fourth thing I see that's important to highlight here is that they shared an experience. They shared an experience. Verse 2 says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the purpose of this message is not to deal with the tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The purpose here is to share, they shared an experience. And they were able to share the experience because they were there together. They were there together. And that's why church attendance is important because church attention is important so we can have some shared experiences together, so that we can encounter God together. So they have this encounter with God together on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes, and it says, cloven tongues as a fire set on each one of them. So they each shared this experience of this baptism of the Holy Spirit, of being brought together into the body of Christ, and also this filling of the Holy Spirit, whereby the Holy Spirit will now come and take residence inside of them. And then they shared another experience together. They started to speak the wonderful works of God. They start bearing witness together to the power of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. That is the miracle of Pentecost. If you read those verses that follows, you find the Medes, the Persians, the Cretans, the Romans, all these different uh, groups. They were all Jews, but they had migrated to different countries, and they had learned to speak the languages in the countries where they lived. But on the day of Pentecost and the other Jewish feast days, they would come back to Jerusalem for the great feast. And so there on this day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, these different people groups from these other nations now, they hear the wonderful works of God, and they're hearing the wonderful works of God in the tongue and the language and the dialect of the nations that they had been living in. Are you following me? That was the miracle. The miracle wasn't the fact necessarily that people were talking in tongues. The tongues that they were talking in were actually languages, known dialects of that day. And the miracle was, we know that these people here are not bilingual. How can they speak the wonderful works of God in these languages and we are hearing in the languages of the countries that we have migrated back to Jerusalem from? Are you following me? They had this shared experience and the experience that they have together is that they're able to testify together and they're able to witness together and their witness and their testimony, it is multiplied because they are together and people are hearing the witness as one witness as one voice. That's what Paul said about the church at Thessalonica. He says, the word of God echoed out from you. It echoed as one voice, and it was reverberating through the cities and the towns that Jesus Christ was Lord to the glory of God, and the only way of salvation was through faith in Jesus Christ. 
So here on the day of Pentecost, where you have primarily a Jewish audience gathered together, these Jewish believers, they have one witness, and the one witness is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they share their experience together. You've heard me say this before. I'm not getting all high with just yet. I say it again. I know I'm repeating myself. I told you when I say that I know that I'm repeating myself, it means I know that I'm repeating myself. But when I repeat myself without saying I know that I'm repeating myself, y'all need to pay close attention. So I'm repeating myself, and I know that I'm repeating myself. But here's the point. The reason that corporate worship is so important, the reason that corporate fellowship is so important, the reason that corporate prayer is so important, and everybody can't be here every week, we understand that, but the reason we come together as much as we can, as often as we can, so we can have these shared experiences. And these shared experiences when we encounter God together, when we sense God together, when our spirits are indeed lifted together and we realize that we are indeed the body of Christ, continuation of God's life, and that God has honored us with his presence and he's lifted us to a high place that we might experience a foretaste of his glory here on the earth. And that's why worship is important. We need to encounter God on the earth, we need to encounter him when we're going through discouragement, when we're going through depression, when we're going through grief, when we're going through loss, we need to have experiences where we encounter God, we're reminded that God has not forgotten us, but most importantly, God is still God all by himself, and God knows where we, we are, and he's able to come and manifest himself to us. That's what worship is, and that's why we encourage you to lift your voices and sing and praise and magnify the name of the Lord because what we want is an encounter with God and what we need is an encounter with God. We don't need another sermon. We don't need just another song to be sung. We need songs that stir our hearts and lift us and sermons that stir our spirits and our minds and lift us so we can encounter God because what we need is to encounter God. It is encountering God. It's what strengthens our soul. It encounters God what reinforces our will. It's what encounters God that revives us to where we decide, I believe I just won't quit, even though I want to quit, but something inside of me won't let me quit. Why? Because I've encountered God. They experienced him together. And don't think that there were some of those Jewish believers who weren't on the verge of wanting to quit. But this is a high encounter. They experienced him together. And they experienced his power. And they experience it together. They experience the power of God, and they experience the power of God together. And the greatest manifestation of the power of God, it is not lame limbs being healed. It is not deaf ears being opened. It is not mute tongues being loosed. It is not atrophied limbs being trithened. The greatest power of God is when God quickens the soul of a person that is dead and trespasses in sin and opens them up to where they can believe and imparts his life to where they can trust and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Are you following me? This is important for us to see and to understand this. They shared these things together. So the people are now confused. The people are perplexed. They don't know what to think. Who are these people? They're, they're barely literate, some of them. Uh, they've been with this Jesus of Nazareth. We think that he was a heretic a spiritual lunatic, and now they're speaking languages that they've never learned. We don't understand all this. They must be drunk. That's an interesting conclusion to reach. It was interesting for them to reach that conclusion is that they must be drunk. They were. They were inebriated with the Holy Spirit, but they were not intoxicated with wine because people, Peter stands up and says, wait, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. What's going on? I mean, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. We haven't even had time yet to get drunk. No, he says, you don't understand. This is a miracle. This is the power of God being put on display. And watch this. Isn't it really interesting that the first demonstration of power that God unleashes through the church was not somebody getting healed? It was not some miracle in that way, but the first manifestation of his power was the gospel being preached by his people under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit that is the first thing that God shows to credential and authenticate the church as the continuation of his life. There's no greater miraculous 
thing that we can be engaged in than to share the gospel, than to tell people that Jesus died for your sins according to the scripture, that he was buried according to the scripture, that he was raised from the dead according to the scripture, that you can be saved by turning away from the way you think and what you believe and putting your faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. That's the greatest power encounter we can be engaged in. And they shared it together. And so I'm not going to go through the lengthy reading of that scripture text, but Peter gets up and as the spokesman of the apostolic band and as the spokesman for the early church, he gets up and explains to them what has taken place. That this is a fulfillment of the prophecy by the Old Testament prophet Joel. How did God had promised he was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Now look at verse 22 and we'll wrap up this morning. I'm not going to be long. Give me about, about 10 more minutes at the most. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him and in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and full knowledge of God, you have taken my lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Another thing they shared was a message. And this is the message of the church. Of all the things that Peter could have got up and talked about, of everything he could have expounded upon, Peter made sure he kept the, the main thing, the main thing. And so the message that they shared, as I referenced earlier, they, they shared this simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ. And what Peter does, he stands up and he lifts up and he exalts the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The whole church is built, is anchored on the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter shares it in the context of what has just happened. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, he identifies him as Jesus the lowly Nazarene, one who had been attested, who had been affirmed and authenticated by God through miracles and signs and wonders. The one who had been betrayed and been crucified had been raised from the dead. That was the message that they shared. And that is the message that we as the church, we have to offer. And we must articulate it. And we must be quick to gospel, gossip the message of the gospel. It's the only hope of salvation. Because we're trying to build relationships with people as we're talking to people. We're doing so asking God to prepare the opportunity to build the bridge across which we can share this message. So we can see from the very inception of the church, it was anchored in the gospel message. It wasn't chicken dinners or chilling dinners or chilling struts. It wasn't these type of things made, which may have their place, but it was about the articulation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only hope. So they shared this message. And Peter goes on in great detail to explain to this Jewish audience why this Jesus of Nazareth, the one whom they had crucified, had filled all the requirements of being their Messiah and the fact that they had crucified their own Messiah. And as he closed this, this sermon, this homily, look at verse 36. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know, for surely, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, and when they heard this, they were cut to their heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, we've read that text so frequently, and we don't understand. This is a, a cry of desperation. It's almost a cry of hopelessness and despair. Peter has basically and charged them, indicted them, and convicted them of crucifying their Messiah. And having heard that they were guilty of crucifying their Messiah, they based was the point of having no hope. And so they cried to Peter, they, what in the world can we do? How can we undo such a crime against God and against, against heaven? We have crucified our only hope. We've killed our Messiah. So it's a cry of desperation. And it's the same cry that many people come to today. 
when they come to the end of themselves, when their choices and their decisions and the consequences of those choices and decisions bring them to a point of brokenness, and sometime in this world, people can seem to be hopeless and beyond any, 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 any sense that things could turn out the better for him, them, so their cry is, what, what, what can we do? What can we do? And so Peter responds, as you know, he responds simply by saying, repent. And let one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, to all who will fall, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. So they shared a promise, a hope, an expectation, an experience, a power, a message. And on this first day, they shared a miracle. The miracle of seeing God open the hearts of people that have been hardened against Christ. Some who probably who cried out, crucified him. Who cried out that his blood be spilled, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit to move in people's lives and to soften their heart that they might believe. And so they shared this together, and this is what bound them together and convinced them that this same power that we encounter when we walk with Jesus on the streets, it is now available to us. And that's what we as a church must rediscover. We must rediscover that the power of God is available to us to do the things that God has called us to do. If we will indeed come together with a hope, with, with, expecting a, a, with great expectation to experience God's presence in our midst, to stir us and to bind us together, then we can experience God's power. God's power that will result in people coming to faith in Christ. Amen? And that should be our longing. That should be our great burden. I know we want our children to be educated. I know we want our children to get a job so they can get off of our payroll. I understand that. I understand we got family members that are sick that we would like to be healed. I understand that we got family members that are aging and that creates a whole other set of circumstances. I understand they're afraid relationships in marriage and they're afraid relationship between siblings. I understand all those things. I understand a lot of people are out of work and the economy is bad. All these things are serious things that, that deserve some attention. But the great burden that should be on our hearts is that people need to be saved because dying without Christ is irreconcilable. We can't turn it around. That's when all is truly lost. All hope is really lost. And so people that are moving around us in and out of our lives, people that we play with, recreate with, people that we entertain, people that we work with are dead in trespasses and sins, and they need to encounter God. And for many of them, their only encounter with God is going to be with an encounter with us. And so we want their encounter with us to, to be so life-altering, they realize that, yes, Jesus Christ still lives, that he still lives, and that there is still hope for them if they put their faith in him. Amen? Let's pray together, shall we?